Great. Great. It's, um, I guess it's, it's probably my third interdisciplinary seminar that uh, I was giving. Kind of every three years I come back to uh, check, check in again um, as, as work accumulate, and it's always absolutely wonderful to, to be here. Um, the first two invitations were f uh, through Walid Rad, uh, who is teaching here and now. I'm absolutely delighted that Leslie and Omar uh, invited me, and indeed, this is a kind of an ongoing conversation that also uh, coincided with the launch of the book, um, whose subtitle probably is a, is is a, is an interesting place to start: violence at the threshold of detectability. And um, if um, perhaps forensic architecture. Um, was presented here before, the sort of the, um, I think that the last time I was here, although I'm sure, I, I, it's kind of in my mind, it's a continuity, but obviously the, the, the only continuous thing is probably the walls and the space here, but never mind, I'll speak back to the, to the institution. I, I explained or I, I, I traced the way in which um, architecture became, for me, a certain optical device to try to interrogate uh, political and military processes. Um, I was speaking about the way in which, as a kind of young man, as a, as a student, uh, I was asked um, at the time by a human rights organization in Israel to help them write uh, what has become later the first human rights report that tried to incriminate architects and planners for what we called at the time crimes committed on the drawing board. Um, the lines tracing, not the fact, and we were, we were looking at Israel's uh, colonial project in the West Bank, in Gaza, but also inside Israel itself, something that um, exhibit somehow similar patterns, uh, although under different uh, juridical framework, um, we were trying to, to identify the way in which the architectural profession itself has been militarized, and as it has been militarized, where violation could actually exist in not only accepting a commission within a situation that is illegal, uh, immoral uh, uh, colonial situation, but really how the crime can be transferred into an architectural language, how a line could be drawn on a map, and that line itself would be used to uh, exercise violence, to cut communities apart, uh, to surround, to shrink the um, Palestinian um, habitat, the, the, the place where cities and towns and villages would otherwise inhabit in order to participate in uh, a policy of, uh, or continuation of the policy of ethnic cleansing in Palestine, architecturally articulated in the way in which the settlement project was built. Um, at the time, the, the political framework, when you, and, and sorry, I. What I wanted to say is that uh, in order to uh, produce this analysis, um, I was involved together with colleagues in uh, the first mapping exercise of that area. Uh, a mapping exercise was undertaken both from, with aerial photographs, uh, some of them taken by ourselves flying over the area, uh, but mainly through sort of traveling through uh, the West Bank at the time of the, what is known uh, here, I think, as the second intifada in the region. It is probably the six, seven, eight, twelve intifada since um, the conflict has begun. But at the time, it involved uh, a sort of a cartography uh, of the entire settlement project that tried to trace the actual built realities on the territory of the West Bank. Um, we finished that project in 2002 
uh, and um, something strange happened. We were mapping the settlements. We, it was used as evidence in all sort of forums, international forums and political forums. Um, but all of the sudden, it also became, we realized that there's a dark side to it. We realized that having collected all that evidence together, that map could also be used by the Israeli authorities, and it has. Uh, and in fact, somebody, I don't have the sketch for you right now, but somebody sent me a photograph of the Israeli military designing the first sketch for the wall on top of that map, on top of a human right. So, so think about the very function and um, place of human rights within political discourse. You want to show something as a controversy, right? As, as a crime, as a human rights violation. Uh, but of course, information could be used by different parties. And that is something that um, continuously entered again and again, bothered and troubled our own work, the possible use and abuse of uh, political critique, the possible use and abuse of human rights discourse, of humanitarian discourse, by the very people that it supposedly confronts. And um, there are many um, instances where a situation like that is always on the horizon of every political activism. You act on a, you, the minute that you want to um, move beyond, let's say, a kind of a more or less academic critique, a reflection upon, a problematization of, and move into the sort of the field where the arena, where politics is made, everything that you produce could uh, be abused. And in that sense, that possibility of abuse must always be part of our work, right? It must always be, we must always bear it in mind. And not always you can avoid it, not always you can predict it, uh, but uh, always it is there as a kind of troubling thought that we carry with us. And I would appreciate uh, at the end of this talk, questions that would carry um, that paradox and idea from the very first moment where uh, a human rights document, in fact, a rather potent human rights document, I would say, that map uh, has been, um, because it has done many other things, uh, but also that possible uh, abuse. A few years later, in 2005, Mapping and cartography transformed completely. It was no, no longer the same practice as we thought of before. And the reason was that, very simple, 2005, Google Earth started having satellite image available very easily online. At the time when we were working in the human rights uh, community in Israel-Palestine, we did have satellite images. They were very old satellite images, almost, um, I think, between three and five years old. And they were always given by the American consulate in Jerusalem to human rights people. I, it came, it is again, material that came from the CIA and was given to human rights uh, organizations. Uh, the resolution was very bad. It wasn't really workable material. Uh, but again, another kind of um, uh, another kind of problematic uh, power knowledge uh, relation that is articulated uh, through this kind of work. But since that moment, cartography had to be transformed. It became an image-based practice. So, from analyzing and mapping a slow violence, the sort of the slow encroaching incremental transformation of a landscape. It's sort of suffocation, taking the air and life out of it in a very sort of slow manner by which every bit of the landscape, trees and roads and bridge and infrastructures, uh, agriculture and industry was used in a kind of, uh, as to kind of suck the air out, if you like, 
of uh, it, a lived territory, um, the kind of violence that we could start seeing as architects, as cartographer, accelerated radically, right? The iterative capacity of satellite images uh, returning to place theoretically every 90, every 90 minutes, right? This is the orbit time of a satellite, perhaps available every few days apart, allowed us to see another sort of event, not the slow violence, but the kind of instant, instantaneous event of architecture. Um, and architects started, or we started to kind of to think about cartography as an image-based practice, to think about um, having to understand images, having to understand resolution, having to understand bandwidth, having to understand frame per seconds when social media became available around 2009, um, especially around our area, where the kind of evidence transformed, the kind of capacity accelerated, and very fast we found ourselves analyzing instances rather than kind of slow, systematic transformations. And then forensic architecture, in fact, as a project uh, was born very soon after, uh, in 2010, as a, 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 an attempt, it, at the beginning it was more or less an academic uh, attempt, it was uh, a group of, uh, of us at, uh, at Goldsmiths, at the, um, some colleagues and students, PhD students, that kind of started thinking about uh, this changing epistemology, this changing aesthetics, if you like, um, the entry of film as a kind of a user-generated material into, uh, into the field, and, um, and, and what architecture could provide within that. Now, what, everything that you would see today is a reflection upon those questions. Um, political question, uh, of perhaps of resistance, if you like, um, a technological question to do with images, the qualities of images and what you can do with images, and a kind of an ethical reflection on the role of truth-telling, if you like, within a conflict. Another very important element that kind of became apparent in the sort of um, truth struggle, if you like, about incidents in, in relation to the Palestine conflict, again, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in um, what is called, is what is internationally recognized as Israel, was it became apparent that violence started to be, behave like a kind of an entangled Thing. It was simultaneously violence, state violence, colonial violence against people and things, the violence that shoots you down and beats you up or destroys uh, your home or orchard or whatever, but simultaneously also violence against the very evidence that violence has at all taken place, right? So we cannot understand contemporary violence within, contemporary state violence within, um, not only within the, the, the West Bank, you would see how uh, it operates in many other places, not only as, um, uh, as, as a violence against people and things, but as, as an attempt to, which you could say is, is uh, uh, is obvious, no? I mean, you, you need to kind of cover up, you need to hide the fact of domination, but something has changed within that because somehow the political and um, diplomatic sometimes strength of a project, and in particular the Israeli project, was in continuously justifying it. And in order to justify it, it had to deny, it had to continuously deny it's that its actions are taking place. And the denial of a particular incident, 
the denial of a, of a soldier killing a Palestinian kid uh, in a place is continuous with a, with a general denial that uh, we could see within the Palestinian situation of the very fact of the Nakba, right? Of the very fact that in 1948 there has been an ethnic cleansing project in Palestine. The denial of the incidents and the denial of the larger political context are continuous with each other. So never when one uncover one particular point, one does not only uncover a particular instance of police or military violence. One breaks through a kind of politics that operates um, as uh, a project of denial. So truth became a certain kind of a, a field of struggle in there. Again, something that could be uh, abused uh, sometimes, and you would see that also. And another thing that became important, and this is just before, I'm, you know, I need to kind of like break this lecture apart, just like speak generally now, and then show you a series of clips. Another thing that became important, another point that I want to say, is that architecture became relevant in relation now, not, it, not, not in relation simply to, to the thing, architecture, the building, that enacts the violation, i.e., a building that is built, or a settlement that is built in order to, in a way that steals land, in a way that cuts apart the landscape, etc. But architecture becomes the optical device within which we could start to understand particular situations. And what I mean by that is that in, um, and now I'm speaking technologically, in an environment saturated by media, saturated by social media, and mainstream media, with a lot of images uh, around, architecture is not only a possible way to analyze it, it is the only way. Um, and the reason is that um, when you have a situation, as I will show you, in which there is an incident, and it is caught from multiple perspectives. When I say multiple perspectives, I can, in the, in the project I will show you, 7,000 different perspective on, um, on a day, on a battle, in a particular situation. Um, in order to make sense of it, you need to look at film through architecture, right? You need to see the spatial relation between all those videos. Because the, the way in which we used to look at social media for example, you know, police brutality here, right? Uh, killing of black motorists. Um, you would usually have the perpetrator and the victim, in, in, those, in those videos that become viral, you would have the perpetrator and the victim in the same frame. You have a story within the frame. But think about it, for every single video that has a perpetrator and a victim in the frame, you would have hundreds of videos that show either only the perpetrator or the victim, or something just before, or something just after, or just capture the sound, or capture something else of it. And those bits of data are simply usually discarded like trash. This is the floatsum, the media floatsum that, that cannot be, it does not partake in the production of history of an event. Um, and to paste them together to start composing a truth statement from them requires space, requires architecture. And um, again, another point that uh, you would see in a second when I start showing you those, um, those, th those uh, stories is that, um, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, what was it? <laughs> this other thing I wanted to say. Yeah. OK. So um, yes, I remembered what I wanted to say. So 
in, in forensics, in, in dealing, in keeping, when we have our files and we need to finally submit them, or at least if we don't submit them to court to keep them for a process, a potential process, a potential trial yet to come, perhaps an international uh, criminal trial of a particular situation, or indeed if we are partake, partaking in a, in a legal process now, the one thing that is um, very important in dealing with images is never to cut those videos, right? So if we think about um, the composition, the filmic composition of images organized through the act of montage, right? Montage or dialectic montage as the kind of the, the building block of political cinema since Eisenstein, cut, connect, cut, connect, create, co shrink and fold space through it, that relation to images, that political relation between images, need to be organized very differently. So from the linear montage to the spatial navigation, the idea of navigating between images, between films that are held in their totality in their full duration, right? The viewer moves from one video to the other within a virtual space. Each one of those videos are continuous and um, but could be seen through and within the architectural model, okay? So this is um, a kind of a little introduction on about the sort of political, ethical, and technological um, reality that uh, I want to uh, discuss with you today. Um, maybe the best way, the best, uh, easiest kind of example to start with uh, would be um, the investigation we have done uh, in Gaza in 2014 um, uh, in the summer of 2014, when Israel has attacked the, uh, the Gaza Strip. Um, and uh, we were working with Amnesty International. At the, from, the beginning of the, uh, from the beginning of the analysis, Amnesty has asked us to um, follow um, the conflict as it evolved. And we were asking, uh, together with Amnesty, to enter into Gaza, because this is what any researcher would do, wanting to, to experience what is taking place there. Um, part, of course, of every investigation that we have is not only um, the issues of availability of images, and etc., but the state um, attempt to block and to uh, reduce our capacity to investigate. So obviously Amnesty, all the journalists that were locked outside, uh, that were not, not yet, not yet in, uh, in Gaza at the time, uh, were not allowed uh, in. We were not allowed in, although one of our members uh, did come in and out twice. Um, and, but we wanted to, um, to undertake our investigation really from the um, evidence produced by people there in Gaza on their own terms. So there's been sequences of bombings of Gaza really since the um, uh, there's been three big sequences of, of attack on Gaza but in this time, in 2014, the kind of media reality was changing because people had um, the kind of the level of penetration of internet and mobile phones was such that uh, a lot more data was, was made available uh, publicly. And also, uh, there was another sort of desire on behalf of Gazans at the time in 2014 to collect, to systematize the collection of evidence. The reason was that the war of 2014 started a few months after um, the Palestinian government, uh, coalition between Hamas and Fatah at the time, ratified the Rome status and in fact um, 
allowed the International Criminal Court to have jurisdiction uh, on Gaza. Now, if you think this is a small matter, um, it is only the International Criminal Court that has jurisdiction uh, in that part. Uh, and however bureaucratic it is, at the time, there was, it was the only thing that both Hamas and Fatah could agree upon. That, uh, and they were, in, in a sense, accepting Palestinian civil society demand uh, to do that, uh, to enter and ratify the Rome Status. But what it had on the ground is a kind of uh, an attempt by Palest initially by Palestinian NGO, by uh, PCHR, by al Mizan, by others, uh, to create what they call the Joint Documentation Unit uh, and systematize the collection of data. People on the ground uh, were uh, filming continuously things that were going on uh, around them, sometimes and often, in fact, understanding that they're risking their lives. Because the open fire regulation, Israel's open fire regulation is shoot to kill anyone aiming a camera at soldiers, right? Uh, but uh, people were sometimes instead of running, uh, sometimes while running, uh, had the camera on and things were uploaded and sent online as if there were messages in a bottle somebody might uh, capture and, and, and read uh, what, was, what was in there. We were asked by Amnesty to analyze um, a particular 24 hours within that war. Um, it was several days after it happened. Uh, we realized that August 1st, 2014, was the deadliest day of the war, uh, the day when most civilians uh, died by a very, very massive bombing uh, of uh, Israel over the civilian neighborhoods of uh, southern Gaza in Rafah. And, um, and as that, um, and, and there was another dimension of that, of that day that was um, extremely interesting and bizarre to look at. Uh, what happened during that day is that at around seven o'clock in the morning, uh, the Palestinian uh, organizations managed to capture and grab hold of an Israeli soldier. That led to the launch of um, a rather unique command within the sort of perhaps the most controversial command in the Israeli arsenal, a command called the Hannibal Directive. Hannibal Directive calls for or allows Israeli soldiers to stop the act of capturing, of a soldier being captured by all means, including the killing of that soldier being captured. So there is a bizarre inverse logic that happened during that day. Palestinians were trying to protect the life of an Israeli soldier, while Israelis were trying to kill an Israeli soldier, right? And that sort of inversion, that sort of entanglement um, was uh, something that we needed, or we were asked to untangle. Whether that thing has happened, what were the consequences of it, uh, of, that, uh, of that particular day. Now, we must understand the role that capturing Israelis played within the entire conflict of Palestine. Um, Non-recognition, which was always a part of Israeli attitude towards Palestinian political organizations, initially not to recognize PLO as the legitimate representative of the Palestinians, uh, now not to recognize Hamas as a political uh, party to any negotiation. Uh, not to grant Palestinians being captured a prisoner of war status. I try them, capture them as criminals. Uh, led to always an attempt by Palestinians to force recognition, to force the very act of negotiation as equals by, by, by having prisoners, in fact. 
and whether and when, whereas in the early years of um, the post-occupation period in the 70s, that was done by hijacking planes, holding people in order to force negotiation, to, 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 to actually allow sometimes non-direct, but at that act of recognition, uh, after the Lebanon war, when Israel was present in, um, uh, the Israeli army was present close to hand to Palestinian uh, armed groups, uh, was by capturing soldiers. And Israel did uh, attempt not to enter negotiation in any time was also based or exemplified by their willingness to sacrifice one of their own, right? We'll kill our own and we will not recognize you. We will not recognize, in that case, Hamas as, uh, as a party to negotiation. So this is the context of a rather complex investigation uh, that, that we had to undertake. Now let's, let's look at the investigation itself. I'll play you um, the video that is a kind of a synthesis of, um, of many of the uh, kind of moves and, 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 and um, techniques uh, that we are using. So here you have um, uh, footage of, and which we'll re we will return to, of the deadliest bombing during that day. Uh, two bombs um, flattening an entire neighborhood and at least 16 civilians uh, were killed. Now, this is what uh, we had to work with. So we were both um, scanning through uh, the social media websites of different, uh, or pertaining to that day, Rafa in um, August 1st. We needed to tell the story of the day from 7 o'clock in the morning, August 1st, to 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, August 2nd, by effectively uh, either receiving from our partners uh, the images that they had, or harvesting them directly from, uh, from the internet. And as I said, we had 7,000 sources. Now the problem with these is that uh, having so many images sometimes does not add clarity to an investigation. Sometimes um, you have a lot of things that you're seeing. On one image, you would have civilians walking with white flag. On the other one, you'd see an Israeli tanks running. In another one, you'd see a smoke plume uh, you know, rising over a neighborhood. In yet another, you, you have images from a hospital uh, or something like that. Um, how to paste a story from those uh, became a um, uh, complicated uh, issue uh, at, that, at that stage. Now, we were trying to, but when, when you get images um, from social media, they come without the metadata. Metadata would tell you otherwise where and when every image was taken. So we had to do that in an analog fashion. We had to actually start looking for the places or ask our friends uh, in Gaza over, uh, over different uh, means of communication. Um, to tell us where they were, but a lot of those um, were rather complicated to find. At the time, uh, we were looking through shadows. We were actually doing a kind of a shadow analysis and trying to recreate uh, the time of each incident. What we realized after several months working on that project, and very, very slow, and, and uh, we were not... Um, getting very far, is that we understood at some point that the time indicator of those images, the metadata of that image, uh, was not existing, or the kind of the analog metadata, right? Whatever would allow you to establish the space and the time, was not existing in the earth part of the image, but rather in the sky part of the image that the clouds or the bomb clouds over Gaza provided for us the physical clocks within which we could start synchronizing uh, the, uh, the incidents. So we started to become very, very tuned to clouds. Cloud, the, the, the bomb clouds, the, their form, um, their duration, and try to actually start mapping 
this sort of war mater materiology, if you like, uh, of it. So here is a kind of a, an example where we were taking three images. One is from CBS. One is uh, on the left is actually, it says here, the resistance press. So that is uh, from Hamas. Uh, that is somewhere from the internet. And we are able to, or we think, we are seeing the same bomb cloud in those three, which would mean those three images are synchronized. So you need to go through sort of a very careful process of looking uh, as precisely as you can at the architecture of the cloud and um, finding the moment of synchronization and verify it and saying, okay, now we have it uh, at the same time. Now start another process that is called geolocation that is very familiar now in open source investigation. In that case, just uh, very technically, you could, see, you could see a football stadium here in the foreground. And you could see here a water tower at the back. And you could, we could find a water tower here. That's the water tower. Um, we could see that those two elements are connected with a straight line directly to the lens of the camera. So we know the, photo, the photograph is taken somewhere along that line. And then you start numbering the different elements within um, the perspective and within the image and uh, measuring those uh, until you are finding not only the location, this, is, this would be simple, this is the first stage, you need to understand the properties of the lens uh, itself. Because from, the, from these, we are going to establish the location of that bomb. Um, you need the location of the photographer in order to uh, define the location of that bomb. Now, so we do it on those three images in the same way. Now, those three images are taken of the same cloud, of the same bomb cloud, but from three separate perspectives, right? So those variation in the angle by which you look at the cloud contain the cross-referenced perspective that we could actually um, intersect in order to find uh, the location. So they would find, they, they would exist at the intersection and now we are checking uh, a before and after photograph and we see yes, that that place had been devastated and uh, we could pretty much be sure that we found that. Now, a satellite, as I said, um, the orbit time of those image satellites, uh, those image satellites one could purchase, although they're quite expensive, for about 1,000 bucks, you can have a satellite image. Um, their orbit time is 90 minutes, but they would return to the same place uh, once a day, because of course their orbit time is 90 minutes, but the Earth is turning, so they would return to be exactly over the, the same place only after 24 hours. Um, but the moment that satellite was above Rafa was also a moment where um, uh, exactly when another bomb uh, has come off, and that has become a very uh, important uh, resource for us in the investigation. But first of all, uh, hold that uh, cloud in your mind, uh, and you could see how we are uh, identifying uh, the time by, opa, by, the sat by, by, by shadow. So here, what we see is the videographer a second before he shuts off the camera, captures two shadow lines, two very clear shadow lines on two uprights. This is a very um, useful moment in order to uh, actually identify the time of that image. But what you need to do is basically account for the, for the uh, barrel distortion on the lens. You need to kind of understand what lens is there and build it into, build the same distortion 
into a 3D model, right? So we were measuring the kind of the anamorphic distortion at the edges of the images, and then you run the time slowly until you establish that that image was taken at 10.53. And um, so we know, we know that image is 10.53, okay? Now we have that, we have this cloud, which is another cloud. And we're looking at this sequence of images uh, that we found in another corner. Uh, oh, sorry, this, this, this set of images was actually sent to us. But as you see, the metadata on these images would come up now um, and would show you uh, 2356 or 36 uh, just before midnight. And these are obviously not just before midnight. Um, so we need to correct, although the, the, the time gaps between all those images uh, exist because they have metadata, so we know those distances in time, uh, but we don't know, uh, we cannot anchor it. So what we're doing here, in fact, is um, looking, if we can find the image on elevation, uh, what architects call elevation, a kind of like a front view, uh, the same image that is here in, uh, on, the, on the satellite. Uh, and then, because the satellite has a metadata, and we found this very same moment, we can now create a kind of a Rosetta Stone, if you like, of cloud shape versus digital time. So now, all those clouds are timed, and whenever we would see that cloud again, we would know what time it is on other images. Uh, and then what we're able to do is start uh, constructing a timeline uh, by looking at the, uh, looking carefully at the clouds. So obviously cloud mapping is something that um, existed as a challenge all throughout the kind of the modern history of painting, if you like, from uh, early Renaissance to the 19th century. Uh, painters and etchers um, were kind of concerned with that, with a cloud as a sort of an unrepresentable object. It was obviously moving faster than the hand of the painter to capture it. And therefore, all sort of techniques to map the sky started to develop from Brunelleschi to um, uh, John Ruskin, um, various sort of grids and attempts to map the sky that we were using, and uh, I don't have them here because I don't have the presentation, but um, uh, they were very useful for us. Also, something that is very important when speaking about bomb clouds is to understand what they are. A bomb cloud is composed, uh, the materiality of the bomb cloud is in fact everything that the building was. If you kind of calculate and break up what makes the bomb cloud, it is mainly, about 80% of it is concrete, about 7% of it is plaster, then you have diminishing percentages, depending on the house, of glass, of wood, of cloth, uh, of the drugs and things you would have in the house, all of those got pulverized by the bomb. Sometimes human remain that are collected together and hanging over um, a situation as a kind of a architecture in gaseous form, right? That is simultaneously a grave and a building. Um, so those if you look at it, when you study it, uh, you study the sort of the temporary amorphous architecture of the cloud versus the hard architecture um, of the ground. And um, so now here, um, when we have established the, the time by looking at the sky, when the clouds allowed us to sync up the battle, we're able now to invert the vision and start looking 
at the ground, to what's happening on the ground, because this is what is interesting. What is happening um, to the civilian? What is the situation with that I, that I mentioned to you before with the uh, soldier that the Palestinians try to protect and the Israelis to kill? Obviously, all around the hospitals, here you see um, an image uh, of a bombing right next to a hospital that is, again, located as a combination of a model and an image. I. The model is what allows us to navigate between one uh, photograph and the other and to compose it. This is, this is what we call the architectural uh, image complex. I. Architecture and the model is really the only way to, uh, to make sense, to move between, between those images. Um, when, when you have so many uh, different sequences. Now something else that we saw looking, when we were looking very um, carefully at the cloud, we noticed another element in the image that, that we haven't previously uh, analyzed and this was, uh, we could see a lot of ammunition falling. So, a video like that of 25 frames a second, when you look at it frame by frame, when you study frame by frame, you actually could see the bomb splinters of a second before it falls and hits the ground. Um, we know that this bomb is going to kill those 16 civilians uh, that I mentioned before. You want more than anything else to have it stuck there, frozen there before uh, falling onto the ground. Um, but um, the question, having identified them, in fact, you see here two images. Uh, this is simply the interlacing of, um, uh, of the way that video works. You have two 25th of a second interlaced. So you have one bomb. You see the kind of the, the horizontal lines, perhaps you can see that divides it. And the other one is 25th of a second away it's the same bomb, 25th of a second uh, away from, from the first one. But you have somehow its size, and um, our lawyers and partners at Amnesty asked us to confirm how big it is, what, what bomb it is. Can you actually measure it uh, in the air? Again, we needed to build the image into the model, so now you have the image actually spread and, and broken into the architectural model. Uh, but having located the, the plane where the, where the bombs are uh, within the model allow us to measure that plane. And we know it is 150 meters, as you can see here, 150 meters and place a grid behind the bombs and then actually measure them and, and figure out they are about 3.6 meter in size, go to the catalog and actually identify uh, the bomb itself, something which would allow any form of, um, you know, sort of supply chain activism to, uh, to operate. Now, the clouds themselves, uh, as you see here, are, are the means of navigating between one image and the next. And having worked also with fluid dynamics, you, you, you start understanding how, if you catch a cloud at two different positions, what it is doing somehow in between. But that, these are the anchors around which this entire reconstruction uh, revolves. But these are also anchors uh, of memory, uh, and they allow, um, in fact, the testimonies um, of uh, the people that we were able to interview were also organized according to those clouds. So imagine the cloud cuts between material, media, and testimony. It's an element that kind of cuts vertically through it and allows you to thread now the individual stories of people uh, on the ground as they remembered escaping through particular uh, bombs um, 
that were there. So it's a kind of a, an element that cuts across these, uh, not only sky and earth, but media, uh, matter, and memory. Uh, so this is uh, sort of uh, an important element within that. Um, in fact, I don't know uh, how much of it I should still um, uh, describe to you. Of course, that, that investigation uh, created quite a strange set of, of responses. On the one hand, um, the supporters of the Israeli army realized that there is a kind of a capacity to hold and to reconstruct uh, things that uh, previously was just simply processes that could not be reconstructed except through testimony. Uh, that we are able to arrive at a sort of a capacity of narrative telling um, tying testimonies, m media, and material evidence together through it. Uh, so there was in, an incredible amount of pushback in, in uh, if I had here kind of my stuff, I would show you the, uh, the incredible sort of response to that. It went from um, uh, accusing us uh, as being uh, filmmakers, Pallywood uh, was what the kind of the term that was used, Palestinian Hollywood. Um, uh, two, finally, the um, Israeli military cancelling the Hannibal Directive uh, uh, at the end of the investigation. Again, a sort of a double-edged sword. I mean, it's not, that investigation did not aim to um, improve the Israeli military conduct, but to, uh, to use a situation of entanglement, a situation of uh, that strange sort of inverted world of um, a manhunt, the Israeli army manhunting their own within a situation, to kind of to open a different perspective onto idea in a strange way, into ideas of partnership, possible, into ideas of recognition, into ideas of acceptance and negotiation through that kind of not uh, that existed in this situation. On the other hand, it was supplied as, as a bit of evidence to the ICC in The Hague, fine. If they will do ever something about it, it will be there. Um, but it's also telling a story, uh, a story that is, um, that is important to, to be written um, anyway. So this is um, one of those um, cases where you see architecture somehow operating in a very different way. Now, when you do large-scale mapping uh, on a slow violence, the presence of politics is, let's say, easier to deal with because you have a state project, uh, you have a chunk of time in which a, you know, that kind of reality has been built. Um, you, have a, you have a big scale. The idea of counter forensics, which is what, what we are doing, uh, is really to see in those micro narratives, why, they, why is it important to tell a story of a day in Gaza? Why is it important to unpack a single killing in, of a child in a West Bank? Um, because in those incidents, we can actually start seeing fossilized larger political forces. So we would not do investigations if, they, if we cannot start navigating out of, a, out of a singularity of an incident back into the political forces um, that have actually uh, produced them. In fact, the temporality of our investigation shrinks further and further and further down to the sort of temporal category that is often inhabited by perpetrators, uh, that of the split second, right? So in many, I mean, I think that here, you know that the last resort argument of uh, a military person or policeman is always the split second argument. What would you do in a split second? We had to decide life and death decision and we made an error, but it's a split second decision, right? Uh, so the split second is a kind of an interesting argument 
when you start thinking the relationship between the event uh, and between larger po politics. So imagine I now showed you another investigation. I just I, I want to move much faster, in which um, uh, an Israeli policeman has shot down a, uh, a Bedouin man uh, while coming to destroy his house. The Israeli policeman finally said, well, it was a split-second decision. Um, and in those small durations, in the kind of the split-second decision, how do you find the sort of the long durée? How do you find the sort of the macro political forces? I think that without thinking the relationship between the incidents, between the singularity and the larger politics, there is no point really of counter-forensics. You need, this is part of what you want to do. So a defense lawyer for that policeman would always want to isolate the split second from history. Nothing happened before, and whatever happened later does not matter. We must only, the, the juridical defense would inhabit simply that split second. Say, the Rodney King trial, no? when they uh, have broken the video of uh, LA police beating up uh, Rodney King uh, into still frames, each one of them was cut out of the entire footage and also cut out of the very history, um, black history in, in, uh, in the US, the history of slavery, colonial history, uh, et cetera. He, Defense would always shrink the temporariness of forensics, and counter-forensics would always need to start from the incident and pull out the historical threads. This is why I started the investigation on Gaza on telling you that that particular day is important because it shows us something about uh, non-recognition, because it shows us something about uh, the problem of prisoners, the centrality of prisoners within the Israeli conflict. It's not reading the conflict through the figure of the prisoner. Uh, and in it kind of in the extreme case is uh, destruction in that, uh, in that case. In the split second, how do you locate the incident within the larger history? How do you pull out uh, those threads? Very often when we come across, um, when we arrive at a point, we arrived at it twice in two separate investigation, when the Israeli army was telling us it was a split second decision uh, to do that, uh, we started to think rather carefully about what does, what does this um, idea of the split second means? It means obviously it's a, it's a self-defense argument, right? You say um, that the only way to defend uh, myself as a policeman, as a soldier, would be to shoot at a situation of grave danger, right? Uh, it's a kind of violence in the way it is uh, argued by defense lawyers, a kind, of ar a kind of argument, a kind of violence that has no calculation Right? I mean, violence, state violence, usually it's a kind of violence that presents itself as a calculation, no? More or less proportionality, balances, etc. It's a kind of a moment where calculation, the split second, is a duration when calculation is impossible, i.e., when the certain subjectivity of the policeman, of the soldier, uh, is simply not uh, emptied out. It's a kind of the moment of muscle memory, the moment of an animal moment rather than a human moment, right? A moment of instinct uh, rather than that. But paradoxically, within that instinct, precisely within that instinct, you see the product, you, because rather than in a calculation, by thinking about the instinct, about what it is that would make a, a, a white policeman in the US have an instinct to shoot a black person. What goes into the production of that instinct? How the long history, again, of slavery, the long history of, of um, 
uh, of uh, political relations to black communities in the U.S. is actually somehow could be identified precisely uh, within the split second. No? So the, it, it is through the small scale that the kind of the large uh, historical political context uh, is becoming uh, manifested. So, okay, so this was one case. Um, I want to speak perhaps about another type of engagement um, that we had uh, in a project um, that exists in a situation where images, where you do not have images. Well, five minutes, that's it. Oh, wow. Okay. Why not? Um, so I spoke about situation when you almost have too many images, too, too much data, and try to make sense of it. Um, we were again asked uh, by Amnesty International to uh, help them in an investigation, to undertake an investigation into a place um, that uh, was known to be uh, the worst uh, torture chamber of the Assad regime. Uh, the prison of Saidnaya, uh, a prison that uh, only victims and perpetrators uh, have seen. So there's, no, there's been no journalist allowed in there, there's been no ICRC visits, uh, Red Cross visits, or human rights organization that were there. Uh, a process that uh, could on, only um, exist within memory. The problem and uh, what um, the context of this project were five survivors of this prison that managed to make their way um, outside of Syria, uh, five of the very few survivors uh, of Saidnaya who wanted to undertake that project, who wanted to give testimony and often within the context of testimonies of victims, you have situations when um, testimony uh, of the worst kind of memories, the worst experience that people have undergone um, is very hard to attain. Uh, think about that. Many in, in a human right context, often testimony would recount the worst moment somebody has lived through. The closer you get to the essence of testimony, the more it becomes obfuscated through all sort of mechanism of filtering, repetition, and uh, lacunae. And um, the process that we have already undertaken previously in relation to other investigations uh, was um, a certain establishing a certain relation between architecture uh, and memory and uh, undertaking slow and very patient processes of building architectural models with survivors and through the process of building, sometimes through the process of building the most mundane elements within a room, the size, the size of the tiles, um, the height of a, of a door, um, of a window, etc. Memories that were otherwise repressed are returned to. So the process of model building, again, is double-sided. Simultaneously, one builds um, a model, an architectural model, representing that space from memory. But the process of architectural building also construct memory itself. So it's not those two trajectories go uh, back and feed uh, each other. The problem in Saidnaya was that the prisoners were led blindfolded. Uh, they, when they were in the room and the door opened, they had to press their eyes, their hands against their eyes. They've hardly seen anything. They were kept in total darkness otherwise. Um, they were at the kind of at the limit, at the threshold of their sense of visibility. And um, also they were not allowed to speak. And when tortured, they were not allowed to shout. 
So you have a situation where you kind of, the lack of sensory stimuli is so extreme that you're at the space between seeing and hearing. They were communicating in a kind of whispers that are, that are, that are sometimes movement, sometimes, you know, whisper anyway functions as something that is between, at the threshold of both vision and uh, hearing. Um, what we have done is, is undertaking a very sort of slow process um, that, um, of um, reconstruction. I would maybe just play you one of those. Um, oh, you know what? Actually, let me play another video now. Where was it? Here, uh, you could see in this example that I will show you now how questions to do with very mundane elements of architecture, um, the, um, int the, the person from forensic architecture, Hania Jamal, a Palestinian uh, architect, uh, is modeling as the witness uh, is describing things to her. Right? So she's trying to model very fast. And she's actually modeling, um, and she's asking very, very trivial questions. And uh, in the process, you would notice how a testimony about uh, an event that he has not described before, um, in fact, uh, comes back to him. She's asking him about the size of the window. I need help with putting the sound back. Oh yeah, I, I think I think I manage it. Let's see. No. Uh, okay. Um, so, so again, the sort of the entry into memory is is architectural. Um, 
in that case. And, and all the, the renderings that you see here are not a kind of simply a representation of the process, but they're part of a negotiation. They're part of the process of building it at the same time as building the memory and, and, and the architecture, uh, i.e. they are kind of vehicles uh, into, uh, into memory. And I want to just end with this um, particular uh, testimony where um, a detainee, a survivor, um, is starting to describe to us something that we know to be uh, a straight corridor. So by the time working with five different detainees, we are able to cross-reference and more or less figure out the architecture of that place. So we knew the corridor he's referring to uh, is straight, uh, but he, uh, well, take, take, a, take a note at how he describes. So it's a it's a kind of a, it's an interesting process when you start collecting the Cartesian errors, if you like, of the description of spaces, and um, we collected them as very precious moments, and we had several dozens of those um, you know descriptions that were not finally. Um, replicable within the model. But we realize at some point that those errors are much more informationally laden than the quote unquote true description of that space because they contain, more, somehow they contain more. They contain both the architecture of that space and they contain the psychological distortion of it, right? Uh, the distortion itself evidence some to a certain extent, more about the conditions of incarceration, the condition of total enclosure that people are uh, existing in, than simply an account, a one-to-one -one account of things. And I think that, um, and I know my time is, is, is well uh, up, but um, I wanted to, to, to kind of to bring to the fore that uh, perhaps idea of you know what we would otherwise consider unuseful information those bits of videos that are discarded because they don't show the entire story those bits of videos that are too blurred to be considered um, a blur in itself is extremely useful for any analyst because the blur is the movement of the photographer Right? Every photograph that you're looking at records from both sides of the camera. It records the people and, th and things that it's aimed at, and it records back the photographer. So if the photographer is moving, that movement is registered on the image. Right? It records both. Uh, so to a certain extent, looking at those blurs is like looking at the blurred memory. It's looking at a certain one-way mirror in which the image of the investigator, the image of the photographer, and the image of the person being photographed are somehow uh, superimposed uh, on each other within those moments. Thank you for listening.